All right. We are live, Peter. How you We're doing? Live. Yes. Mics are working. Every no technical difficulties. Not yet. Keep your yet. <laughs> and you're all dressed up. You, look so you are strong. too. Look at you. I, I came down uh, looking like a like a hippie. Uh, and then I saw you and I was like, uh, man, I need to look nice. Yeah, so. I know, I had a couple of meetings it. today. So I, it, it kind of distracts from the chaos in my office that's being demolished yeah. right now. You can see the, we're going for the retro wall. Nice, uh, I like it. Yeah, it looks a lot better it, than uh, last week. With uh, <laughs> It, it yeah. looks like I really did go crazy in, in my cuckoo's yeah. nest. Yes. All right. Well, let me, let's go ahead and introduce it. And then we'll jump in to introduce <clears> our guest. We've got a exciting episode lined up for us today. So I'll start with our little podcast intro. Hello, welcome to Sound Engagement. Um, it's a podcast devoted to engaging with our culture and community from a Christian worldview. I'm your co-host, Brad Mills. I'm Peter Anderson. <clears throat> and uh, just to clarify before you introduce our guests, I do want to say if you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, uh, we want to welcome uh, you to the show and invite you to leave any questions or comments. Um, we'd love to interact with you during the show. And so if you have any comments for our guests or for ourselves, uh, feel free to leave them and we will uh, try to respond. All right. You ready, Peter? Yeah. So uh, add our guests. Yeah. Yeah. We're very excited. Um, so, so Monique, I, I, before I, uh, before, I just want to introduce you, if that's okay. And we really have just a very exciting guest today. Um, Monique uh, has a background in social services and children's ministry. Uh, I'm so, so interested in that because I'm actually a family therapist. I'd love to talk to you more about that. But um, yeah, so it's, it looks like uh, you have a diverse array of underserved communities. You served a lot of under, underserved communities and Worked as a missionary to South Africa for about four years, serving children and teachers. And then two decades. Uh, reason why I reached out to you because you you served um, you have you spent over right around twenty years advocating for critical race theory or CRT. But uh, through a series of events, uh, saw some problems with it, saw some uh, contradictions with it, with uh, with what you saw as a as a Christian worldview. And uh, we're uh, it looks like you have a B a BA and. Uh, sociology from Biola. My brother-in-law teaches at Biola. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. So his name is Matthew, Matthew Wright. So I have to um, connect you with him. So if, are you still at, and now you're at Talbot uh, School of Theology. Yes, um, I'm at Talbot. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Tell Matthew Wright. Hello. He's my brother-in-law. So <laughs> okay. I've been there for all of like 27 minutes, but you know, I'm oh, okay. getting my feet wet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't ask me yeah. theological questions. y'all. I won't. No, no. Put that <laughs> right. so, oh, hilarious. Yeah. Well, Monique, we are delighted to have you on as our guest. Um, and I've Thanks actually, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, we, we kind of, you know, we're following people, any, any Christians, any people, uh, anyone who was talking other podcasts or just resources that we could find dealing with the topic of race, race, racial reconciliation and coming at it from a view that was um, concerned about some of the approaches uh, that we find, especially with critical race theory. And so we've, you know, followed some of the stuff that Neil Shinvey and Pat Sawyer have done. And I know that they've been guests on your show, your podcast uh, with Krista yes. Bontrager. They, and so we'll- they good friends. I appreciate them very much. Yeah, well, we're thankful for their work. We're, in fact, we, ha we have um, a, a podcast lined up in the near future, I think in a few weeks with um, uh, Pat Sawyer. So- we're looking forward to Yay, that. That'll be a good one. Yeah. 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 That. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, anyways, we, but before we jump into that topic, which we'll spend the bulk of this hour uh, dealing with, I, I wanted to ask you really about your experience. Cause it says, you say it's one of your passions. Um, you know, that really almost a foundation of your passion is, is this time that you spent with children doing ministry, especially your time in South Africa, which sounds like it was, pretty much right after your uh, college years, or you can correct me on that. Yeah. <laughs> Not right yeah. after. Okay. Tell Not me right more after. about your ministry then. So I, goodness gracious, I have always wanted to work with kids since okay. I was a young child myself and went to, you know, did, did my schooling and went to Biola 
After Biola, I started working in group mm-hmm. homes with kids who had been, um, well, my first job was actually working with teen girls who found themselves pregnant and their families either kicked them out, like they had mm-hmm. been disowned, so to speak, and needed a place to stay. And so there's a, a group home for girls down in um, Santa Ana, which is in Southern California. And they do a lot of good work with, with teen mothers. And so I found myself there and loved it. It was um, my mm-hmm. first group home experience. I absolutely loved it. It was challenging, but it was good. And from there, mm-hmm. I thought, oh my gosh, I'll stay in group homes forever. I will open up a group home. And the Lord really just had different plans. And it took me on a journey out of group homes into family case management and then program management and program development. Mm. And so I did that until, gosh, until I moved in 2014. And so I moved to South Africa in 2014. And I have been going since 2010 once a year. And then in 2014, I moved there permanently. And I moved, my original goal was to do more dance therapy, was to um, get kids to to express emotion through movement. And the principal at the school that I was at, and I was only in one school at the time, he realized that I had a background in social service and asked if I would talk to two of their kids. It was just two kids. And I was like, sure, why not? These two boys. And from there, it became hundreds of kids and interns from the states that ended up coming over um, every semester and doing all kind of work with families and kids and teachers. A lot of the children in the area that I was in, which is known as the Cape Flats, which is in Cape Town, they experience extreme poverty, gang violence. There's tons and tons of trauma. And because of of trauma and the the implications of trauma, the functions of, of, of a traumatized brain and things like that, a lot of them had stunted growth and, or stunted growth in their ability to learn. And so it was, when I worked with teachers, it was how can, how can we get kids to be able to be grounded enough um, within themselves, within their brain to be able to open up capacities for learning? One of the things that you would see in, in the Cape Flats is that I'd say, gosh, probably 85 to 90 percent of the children have seen either a violent incident, have been um, the victim of a violent incident, has had a parent who's died or, or has a parent who's in jail, something like that. There's something traumatic going on. And so because of that, we there was a large scale trauma within schools. So we could do these these trainings with teachers and say, you know, these are some techniques you can use to to help ground your children. Like when they come in from recess, this is something that you can immediately work with them on to be able to open up learning capacities because the schools themselves wouldn't receive as much funding if the school was low performing. Mm -hmm. But now you're working Mm -hmm. with a school that is 90 percent traumatized children and Mm -hmm you know, the majority of them are not performing at grade level. The majority of students are dropping out by grade seven, you know, so what do we do with that? How do we open up not just capacity for learning, but passion for learning? How do we teach parents that your child should not drop out of, you know, seventh grade so that they can go and work? Mm. So that was, that was a good four, four years and a couple months, four years, I want to say three or four months. Yeah. Mm. But yeah. Was there any be, before I let Peter ask? Questions. Yeah, no, please. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Was there any particular experience that just stands out as sort of hmm. and just a highlight of that time, whether it was a learning experience for you or just an encounter you had? You know, I, there's a, a little boy, and I still actually have his picture, mm-hmm. and he was in. Gosh, she was one of the original two that I was um, like supposed to work with through this this mm-hmm. pe- principal, and he was kicked out of the school in fourth grade, and he never went back to school. 
And so two weeks before I moved home, I saw him sitting on a bus bench and I'm here and they all call me Mo or Miss Mo. And I hear someone calling my name, Miss Mo, Miss Mo. And I'm like, who is calling me? And eventually he gets my attention and he's sitting on a bus bench that's actually right outside the school fence. And he calls me over and he's talking to me and he's like, I always remember you. Oh my gosh, we had so much fun when we would race and you know all these things. And he was like, I still have the Bible that you gave me. I still read wow. the Bible that you gave me. Wow. And you know, for me, I think so working with so many students, you wonder, like, oh, I wonder, you know, what what this student is doing. I wonder if they remember or mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you know there was any impact and was the impact lasting. And mm -hmm. to me, that was just such a, a awesome interaction, you know, that he would from, uh, because he wasn't allowed on the campus, he, you know, stood at the fence and, you know, just called my name and I couldn't believe, I hadn't seen him in a few years. And so I couldn't believe that he was there and that he mm -hmm. would even remember the Bible that, mm -hmm. that I had given him. And so yeah. that's a special experience for me. Very yeah. Cool. Well, it's so difficult with trauma, like it, it, it's like with trauma with any kind of trauma victims. You never know the kind of stability that you're bringing in their lives until much later. That's that's. Mm -hmm. uh, are you aware of a uh, Bessel van der Kolk? Do you do you ever read any of his work? Where you, hmm. um, where the the body, the body keeps, keeps the score? score. Or, body yeah. keeps the score. Yes. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. He's up. He's up in our area. I would. I would. Um, at the Jamaica Plain, he's done some really, really great work with uh, trauma. What got you into that? What got you into working with kids in trauma and specifically anything in particular that, uh, it was, it was just, yeah. a need. it was quite wow. by accident. I, mm. I literally just ended up reading and reading and reading, um, and not, you know, there, there's a very fine line because one, they're kids. And so they're continuously developing and, um, and just because you experience a traumatic event doesn't mean that it's going to traumatize you. So then it's mm. kind of like, well, you know, here, mm how are you That's going good. to develop after you experience this event? How can right. I walk alongside of you and continue to assess and see what's happening for you? I had a sibling set whose father killed the mother and the kid, the kids were there and South African laws are a lot different than ours. And so the kids were still with the father. The, the son did, and this might sound insensitive, but he did quite well in, mm -hmm. in the middle of all of that. Daughter went mute and, you know, just had a completely different experience. There was only a year, maybe two years in between them. So they were still close in age, mm -hmm. but you just never know what, you know, how it's going to, how it's going to play out. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to not being, and I, I never, I never pretended to be a trauma specialist or right, yeah. anything like that. Yeah, I didn't want to overstep my bounds in doing mm. something like that, and especially with a child. So right. it to me, it was it was very, very a very tender road to walk. I did receive a lot of counsel. I do have a friend who is a trauma therapist, mm. and so it was always a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of you know talking to her. I actually had mm. her come out and train our teachers so that they could oh, wow. get, yeah. you know, the that side of it, you know, when, when you're looking at um, the oldest part of the brain, that more reptilian part of the brain. And, and when you go into things like fight or flight, freeze, fawn, you know, mm -hmm. how, how do we experience that? And how do we um, understand that in working with kids? What can that look like? Does it look different than adults? Mm. And also then things like secondary trauma. If you have a, a classroom with 75, 80% traumatized students, you yourself are going to be experiencing, or you hold the potential to experience some secondary trauma. How do we now work with students? I mean, with teachers. Right. And so I had her do sessions with our teachers and our principals and things mm -hmm. like that. Um yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was quite by accident, but also a very wow. delicate road to walk. Um, just because I wanted to make sure that I was coming from the most professional place possible, but also from a pl place of love and care, mm. you know? Well, that actually, yeah, leads to my second question, because I think, you know, one of our biggest concerns with some of the race topics is that there has been trauma in a significant portion of, of African-American communities, obviously. And I think the, 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 um, 
you know, I guess the appeal of critical race theory, it seems to answer some of that, you know, it seems to, at first, it's it's very appealing. I came up here to Boston, look very attracted to it myself, uh, critical race theory, and as a, as a clinician up here in the Boston area, of course, that's just kind of what you got. You even know what you're getting, you know, until a little bit later, you start reading about multiculturalism and the history of that. And you start to kind of do a little bit more homework. You're like, wait, you know, um, I'm not sure if this, you kind of get some tension as a, a and, as I really definitely saw that in some of the queer movement, the queer theory movement. I saw some similarities there. But I mean, what was your, it says that you spent two decades just advocating for critical race theory. What, um, could you define for us, you know, what that is and what was your experience supporting it? And what was the, what was the attraction? What was the appeal? I would um, say in, in, in mm. layman's terms, in the most like mm. lay way possible, critical race theory, one is part of a, a bigger, um, a bigger set of theories called critical social theories. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. that you have things like critical race theory, queer theory, um, ableism theory, child studies, fat theory. There's a bunch of, of different theories. And what it really does is it, it separates um, people into different groups. So it's mm -hmm. a very tribal theory. It separates people, critical race theory does, separates them based on their ethnic makeup. And then it really looks into, it takes a critique, a critical look into society to see how people are either advancing, not advancing, being oppressed, um, or are the oppressors within a society? What does that look like? And what are the the causes and reasons for that? It... Um, hmm it to me stands very antithetical to the Christian worldview in mm -hmm. that our identity is first in Christ. With mm -hmm. CRT, your identity is first in your ethnic makeup and there is no escaping that. Mm -hmm. And so that would, in, in a very quick layman's, layman's view, it is that it's the look into society at who are the oppressed and who are the oppressors based mm -hmm. on race, who is advancing, who is being kept down based on their ethnic makeup. Yeah. Now I got into it, mm -hmm. I think quite accidentally mm -hmm. growing up and I grew up in South LA, growing up in South LA, mm -hmm. there were just things that we talked about things that we heard. I was um, a child when the, the LA riots happened. And in mm. living through that and hearing your teachers talk about that, that white people think they can do black people any kind of way, or, um, you know, you'll only be able to go so far because you're black, or you're always going to have to work twice as hard because you're black. White people always want to X. Black people will always Y. You know, mm. like it, there's mm. there was just this chasm between black people, people of color and white people. Now at that time, it was also um, very, um, there was a lot of tensions between blacks and Koreans. And so mm -hmm. again, you see another tribal group. And so everything was kind of put into the tribal groups. And in going to, to university, I studied sociology and I studied sociology with the intent of going on to get an MSW and doing social work. Hmm. But in sociology, you learn the social theories. Mm -hmm. And so in learning the mm -hmm. social theories, I automatically learned critical race theory. My institution, the institution though, did not, did not separate this out in a way of saying, look, this is what culture believes. This is what they say. This as a Christian, because I went to a Christian school, this is what we believe. Mm. And how, how do you thread that out? How do you understand what's happening in culture and yet understand what your Christian beliefs are and what, what objective truth is and move forward from that place? Mm. Mm -hmm. And from there, I yeah. just... I, I literally ran with the idea of the glass ceiling and mm -hmm. being a marginalized people group that I would always have to work twice as hard, that the stacks were always, like the decks were always stacked against me. Um, mm -hmm. White people are always gonna believe this way. They have like their white version of Christianity that's always putting people down. They don't understand what it is to be oppressed. They don't understand, you know, what it's like to be the descendant of a slave and, um, you know, or to have have 
be, or to live like on the other side of Jim Crow and redlining and they don't care. Mm. This was kind mm. of the, the belief that I lived in gr- after my university time. And so in social work and in program management and things like that, even though I did really good things with like creating programs for teenagers or you know, sitting and having one-on-one sessions with kids and things like that. It was always from this place of, I need to help you better yourself in order to, in order to be able to propel yourself to the next level, because you're not like a white person isn't going to help you with that. Mm. You're always going to have to work twice as hard to be where a white person is. Was was there something in your background too, that made that kind of like a like I'm thinking just pure behavioralism, just like there was some kind of reinforcement that seemed, wow, I have some, um, I have a voice here that I wouldn't have had if, you know, I, if I ignored it, was there, was, was it, yeah. Was there something in the back, in your own background that just made that just sound attractive? You know, it's like, wow, there's, there's, I didn't know if, or if it was a theory that just kind of fit your worldview really well. Uh, yeah. Cause I, I'm still trying to, toy with that a little bit on what, you know, why, why people are, why we are initially holding on to that. And almost like we have to hold on to it for a very long time. A lot of, you know, so I didn't know what your thoughts were as a follow up to that. Yeah. I think that Mm -hmm. the, the conversations at home at my friend's houses in school, these are the conversations that kind of laid the foundation Mm -hmm. and going to school at Biola, those conversations that were had then were now supported and confirmed through statistics. They were confirmed through theories, through reading Marcuse, through reading Bell. Like they were, I now Hmm. had, Hmm. instead of just this conversation that's like street conversation, I now had a name for it. I now had, Hmm. I now had support and my teachers are Christians. So Hmm. now I know that, I know this is true because of the the support that came in university. Mm. Wow. Mm. Sorry, I keep having to mute my my microphone. I think there's like a helicopter overhead and a train coming through and it's just uh, crazy. So if you're hearing that, sorry. I, um, but I did want to follow up and you kind of hinted at this already in your answer, but just thinking through how how your advocacy and support of critical race theory impacted the way you did ministry maybe the way you interacted with others. You mentioned how you you kind of felt like you had to prepare them for a world that was always going to be opposed to them, never going to give them any support. So, I mean, were there any other interactions that, where you felt like maybe even it impacted the way you interacted within a Christian fellowship? You know, like where there was just a way you... I think it was all very enmeshed. Mm-hmm. And so everything I did just came from this place. I think a good example of that is the other day, you know how on Facebook you get your memories and you can, you can see all those things. And so I had a memory pop up in my Facebook feed. I think it was my Facebook feed or either that or like I was looking at old pictures on my, my phone. But there was a picture of me um, that I took right before I left from South Africa. And I'm holding this book for um, like a website a partner's website that I was working with. And I'm holding up a book called A is for Activists. And it's a children's book, but it's also laden with this idea of we of anti-racism. Mm-hmm. And if you're familiar with anti-racism, anti-racism is also steeped in this very tribal narrative that everything is, is pitted into you're either a racist or you're an anti-racist. You know, there's no just not, like, I'm not a racist. I can't just not be a racist. Everything you do is from either a racist bend. You're either a racist or you are actively working to combat racism. But there's there's no in-between in that. And that also goes into some critical race theory things and critical social theories. But I'm holding this book. And when, when it came up in my memories, I was like, wow, I forgot all about that. And just how it was, I think it was an eye opener for me of just how blind I really was to the the fact that everything was so enmeshed. When I'm working in in children's ministry, and we might be talking about the tithe, I am also like literally we're doing math problems on the board because I want to make sure not only that you know scripture, but that you also know your math because you're going to have to be twice as good in order to get ahead. Hmm. That's interesting. 
Peter, you're you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't want you to. <laughs> um, <laughs> baby was crying. So we always have these little outside events like, oh, mute. <laughs> so I also, one of the things I really wanted to reach out to you too, Chantel, is that I saw that you were, you're, you're, but you're a convert. <laughs> if I could put it in that word. I mean, what, what I mean by that, like, um, I do have a lot of Christians that have bought full heartedly on this. I've lost friends over this. Brad, yeah. Brad could say the same thing. I've got uh, Christian leaders that I have uh, trusted with now after George Floyd just completely buying into it and buying the woke church and Jamar Tisby and, you know, everything that he's saying. And I read a lot of his stuff and I'm like, my goodness, this is, um, this is some real concerning things that are saying here. And um, I actually, it's funny. Cause I, um, I, I uh, tell you a little bit not to talk about myself, but you know, I, I got away from it because as a clinician, I started counseling uh, w women who were in abusive relationships and I heard the same stuff from the same theory. Like if you don't listen, it means you're you're you've you've got a problem with my you know with my maleness or whatever. If you don't listen to me, it's because you're 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 going against my my influence over this family. And he would use often he would use the exact same tactics, emotional blackmail. It's because you know you're not listening to what I'm really trying to say. He would use the same kind of you know uh, very like in a. Uh, kind of manipulative rules like some of these anti like Ibram Kendi would use and some of these other people that I'm like my gosh you're not even allowing the person to even speak you're already kind of labeling them so um, I'm just curious like tell tell me about your story about how you you were like wait I I'm not buying this because it's 20 years 20 years is a long time <laughs> you know I mean you're doing ministry you're doing a lot of work you're you're serving the community you're in social work you're doing and then all of a sudden just bam I, you're, you start to see real contradictions and you leave it. And that's, that's harder later in life to immediately leave something like that. So I would just love to hear your story on, on that. Peter, we didn't got to say later in life like that. that <laughs> I'm right, just saying. Right. It, it yes. ain't going to be later. You know? <laughs> like the sun is early, early in life. You've got a long way to go. So yes, there you go. Oh, <laughs> um, Thank you. Call me out. Call me out. I'm just saying. Oh, and you know what else I wanted to say? You <laughs> call me Chantal. Um, on, on the screen, it does say Monique, and I usually do go by Monique, but for anyone who's watching, Peter is not crazy. My first name is Chantal. Chantal. So it's Chantal oh, Monique. Oh, my yeah. God. Yes. No, okay. no, no. It's no yeah. problem. But I know people are like, did he just call who's her that? the wrong name? Yeah. No, oh, okay. no. This one, okay. I got you back. Got okay. You. All right. All right. I think I corrected him on that um, a, a few episodes ago he, when we kind of were teasing I, that we would Yeah. I said, it's not Chantel, it's Monique, right? That we're talking to? And no, Chantal. Yeah. Okay. All right. I mispronounce, right all I, I mispronounce everything though. Just to let you know. It's uh, it's kind of a, anyway. So yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> I just didn't want people to think like, who is he talking about? Who the That's heck me. is he talking about? <laughs> right. That's still me. Same person. <laughs> right. Um, so what did it look like to come out 20 years later? Mm. It, it it was a road and it's wow. still a road. Like, I, I'm not going to lie. Like, it's mm -hmm. still a road. Mm -hmm. Um, what some of the things that happened were that I moved home. I moved while, um, while Obama was president mm. and moved home when Trump was president. Oh, right. And mm those two things really brought like it when i came home my eyes were just open like people were just different <laughs> it was so angry yeah. social media feeds were angry and um it was just it was just a different climate than mm. i think what i left i didn't access a lot of american media when i was over there so i wasn't looking at you know news or anything like that and i don't watch tv anyway mm. but when i came back um the the news i was the whoa like people people are really angry and riots and you know all of these things and so i didn't know what was going on mm -hmm. um but i was just like well lord i need some some insight and i didn't hear much you know i was just like i don't know i still don't know what's going on i ended up getting a job and at this job i had an intern and the intern came to work one day and was crying and was just like, you know, people of color are just, and she was at a small Bible college out here. And was just like, you know, they, they tell me that I'm fragile, that 
I don't have a place to talk. I shouldn't speak. If I speak, then I'm speaking from a place of privilege. And she just went on and on and on, like through her tears. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like there is something drastically wrong. On the other side of that, I have been having conversations with a friend who's now my ministry partner and um, our conversation, she's a theologian. Her name is Krista Bontrager. And she's a theologian who really Hmm. just unpacks the word for you. And when we would begin to have conversations of race or justice and things like that, I was just like, well, that's not what the word says. The word says you need to do justice. And she'd be like, well, how do you define justice? And I literally would want to walk out of the conversation. I'm like, no. <laughs> These conversations, I think, were the beginning of, of the storm for me, uh, the storm of, of my own soul of being like, okay, God, you know, it's either going to be this or it's going to be that, but I don't see a way to marry my friendships and what my intern is saying and all of that with what I say that I believe. Like there's 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 a disconnect somewhere. I would have mm. these conversations with Kristen and be like, well, you know, Micah 6, 8 says we should all do justice. That means you should, you know, do X, Y, and Z. And she would ask me, well, how do you define justice? Um, where do you see that I need to do X, Y, and Z? And where does that fall in line with justice? Is it actually, are you really defining justice? Are, what about this is sin? You know, how do you reconcile this verse with this? And one day in prayer, I was just like, God, I need her to recognize her whiteness and her white privilege. And I need I need you to do it quick because I didn't know how much longer, you know, I had in this conversation. Wow. And the Lord was very clear with me that you need to repent of social justice. Wow. I feel like I have had a couple of very clear conversations with the Lord. One of them was when I knew that I was supposed to move to South Africa. It was clear like that for me. It was, you need Mm. to repent of this. And I didn't know what that meant. At first, there were some words I can't really say on air because I was like, what what in the world are you talking about? Like, this is so true. Like, people actually, are- Actually, you can. We've said, we've- okay. <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> Wait, It's just you not know? PG. It's not like PG, okay. you know, uh, sound engagement. Well, so- uh, a therapist. I'm the pastor. I'm a, yeah, so. <laughs> right. I make up for it. Right. Thanks. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it, it was so real and it was so gut-wrenching because this is my entire paradigm. And, you know, not only did I come home from South Africa and coming home from South Africa is a whole nother podcast, whole nother story. But, you know, I came home under some special conditions and now my paradigm is also shifting. And it wasn't a thing of, you know, maybe I'm going to start to consider this. It was no, like as as firm as I knew that I was supposed to leave, leave and go to South Africa, it was the same voice that was like, you need to repent of this. And so at that point, I now need to understand why? What do? What is it that I'm repenting from? What is the 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 parts of this paradigm that don't align with what you you are for, God? Like, help me help me understand this. And mm-hmm. God is very gracious and gentle, and He did. Um, I think part of it is is the identity aspect. Mm-hmm. You know, my identity it was as a black woman. First, I love being black. I'm not even gonna lie. Like I love it. <laughs> uh, it, it you know, it comes with its challenges, but but I love it. It or it has. People can say, you know, um, right. right. Yeah. But I can't love the color of my skin more than I love my identity in Christ. Amen. And if my identity is in Christ, then that makes the three of us brothers and sisters, mm-hmm. brothers and sister, because you know, well, I'm the only yeah. one. Um, <laughs> But, mm-hmm. and how do I walk that out? See, with, with CRT, you belong to your tribe and you need to stay with your tribe. And this is one of the things that people get hung up on is I can't really speak out for you, for justice in this area, for, for things that are happening to, you know, white people, because I have to stay with my tribe. So we yeah. can't talk about the, the suicide rate among white men. I can't talk about the way that culture has been attacking white men, especially um, like white, straight Christian men, I have to fo- focus on this here. Though in that category, that's the oppressor. So that that's going to be a, a bad category. They don't right. understand all scripture. They don't, they don't have an, an ability to understand the scriptures truly mm. because they don't wear melanin, the, the, the melanin that I wear. They don't have my experience. 
So it, it breaks us mm. up. And I think that was one of the first things. I remember Kristen and I, we do a podcast mm. called All the Things. And right before mm. we go on a show, she's she asked me, she goes, so let me ask you, do you identify more as a black woman or as a Christian? And I was like, see, see now why we got to, why we got to ask that kind of question. But it, those are the things that we aren't thinking about all the time when we uphold a CRT worldview in CRT. My identity is, is the skin that I wear, but in Christianity, my identity is found in Christ. And because my identity is first found in Christ, my, my skin color is going to take a back, a, a back seat. Doesn't mean that that Christ doesn't care. He wasn't intentional in making me, but my identity is new. For um, I believe it's Second Corinthians five sixteen says that we don't regard each other according to the old man. Mm-hmm. For God has made all things new, and so if I'm not going to regard you according to the old man, then that means that this is also part of that old man. Wow. Now, when I see people experiencing injustice based on, you know things like skin color or things like that, I'm free to use my voice, my vote and my dollar to say, not today. We're not going to participate in this way. You're not going to treat an image bearer like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But regardless of their skin color. Regardless of their skin color. I'm just free like, yeah, I mean, justice. Right. And right. not just justice for the marginalized or the minority. Right. Mm. Justice isn't God's biblical view of justice is without discrimination. Like it's indiscriminate. Mm -hmm. I should be able to do justice for whomever, Mm. the whomever. Mm. And what what we're seeing today is that justice looks like it needs to be done only for the person of color. Um, But anyway, sorry, I've gone off on a tip. I think that's probably one of the most powerful statements I've heard in a really long time. God told me to repent for social justice. I, I, I'm still kind of like feeding on that when you said that. It just was, that was a very powerful statement. Yeah. 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 And, and mm. the idea that you brought up of kind of the attacks on especially white mm. male uh, Christian men, it, it, it's almost as if CRT teaches you that that's justified. That's actually healthy and good. They need to be brought down. They need to be humbled and uh, because they can't see it any other way. So uh, just thinking through, I kind of want to take you back a little bit now, um, because for me, I'm my oldest daughter is getting ready to attend college and we're looking. And in fact, I know, I happen to know your most recent episode dealt with that on all the things podcast. I was listening to it intently um, because <laughs> I was waiting for some, a, a list of names, universities to consider. But um, one of them- You must have been listening for a long time because that's a short <laughs> list. <laughs> that's exactly what yeah. your guest said. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know. And it's, and it's sadly like I have, when, when I, we visited three campuses with my daughter and- um, and I, and I intent I, I was intent on asking that question of of each campus, kind of where do you stand on uh, the issue of racial reconciliation, and um, you know how are what is the kind of the circumstances at this campus among the student body as well as among the faculty and the administrative? Are they all in favor of of certain uh, trains of thought, critical race theory, and anyways, I just asked those questions, and I came to think I. It, it seems like every campus is dealing with it at some level and there's probably some level of compromise at every campus. Um, so how do we prepare our daughter to go and, and hopefully have some places where, where she can be really grounded and have mm. some foundational teaching. But anyways, all that to say, one of the places we visited was Viola. Um, and so I wanted to know if you now looking back on that time, do you have reservations today? Do you obviously tell it's connected? So, I mean, do you have reservations though about Biola as a university? I do. Okay. I do. And, you know, I, I can't go into all of that for, um, you know, privacy reasons and things like that, but I do have reservations. I have reservations about most Christian universities. I don't think that Biola is um, alone in its struggles, you know, to to find its way through conversations of race, justice, unity, diversity, equity. Um, And I think that they have some people who are just like at every other Christian university who are really pushing to get this worldview or framework um, broadly onto campus. 
-hmm. And, and that's troubling because young people today aren't ready for that conversation. You know, they, they aren't ready to, to, they're not grounded enough. I'll say that they're not, they haven't been grounded enough to be able to understand when someone is talking to you about whiteness and your white privilege and your white fragility and how whiteness is wicked and all of these things, they don't know how to take that on. Hmm. And if it's a professor, I would say a good chunk of them would never raise their hand and say, well, what do you mean by that? Or I disagree. Can we have another viewpoint? Hmm. And so they're being hit with a lot. We've been, my ministry partner and I at the Center for Biblical Unity, we've been, you know, in contact with students and faculty from numerous universities. And we hear the same thing is, you know, they're not ready for this, this, and, and, and not only are they not ready for it, but it's so damaging emotionally. And if they're not given any other options, and this is only presented as truth, then what do I do when I'm 18? I'm a freshman and I'm sitting in class and now I have to read Jam Jamar Tisby. Yeah, it's a good history lesson, but now you want me to pay reparations out of my student worker paycheck? Mm. You know, it, and, and where do I fall with that? Where do I, how do I learn about um, the history of America and yet not have to wear the burden for all of the history of America because I'm 18 and I'm white? You know, some schools have, have groups just for white students so that they can talk about their white privilege. And, and, you know, when, when we look at, and I used to, I used to be the president of the Black Student Union at Biola. That wasn't, it was for, for, I would say for minority students, it's a thing of like celebrating your ethnic makeup. Mm. But when you get to the white, white group, mm. like, damn if you do, damn if you don't, like, I'm, my, you want to damn my, 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 the color of my skin, things I have no control over and tell me how I need to divest myself of my whiteness and recognize my privilege. Hmm. It, it's a very different conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I really fear that we are going to, if we're not careful, we will lose many young people at the university level because they're not grounded in their identity. They don't, they don't understand who they are in Christ, number one. And two, we're giving them a very toxic gospel. And I'll put gospel in quotes. Mm -hmm. We're giving them a very toxic message. Mm -hmm. How do they, how do they, reconcile that. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 when you say like, they're not ready, I don't know. I don't know. Cause now they have to be, it's like, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I have some, I have some interesting thoughts about that because it's like, whew, you better get ready as a part of me wants to say that it's like, this is it. And um, I think you're right developmentally. I, I mean, I love what Jordan Peterson says, where he says, clean up your own damn room before you change the world. And there's a, there's a, oh, see, I told you it's not PG, <laughs> you know, but there's some real truth to that too, about like what is and what should be and how I, I how I'm supposed to get there through my actions. And I, I think you're, you're spot on in the sense of when you're trying to be, I mean, because what, what I'm doing is with, with critical race theory and activism is like they want they want to make you an activist from about age five. A is for activists. I read that book at a little um, bookstore when I was shopping with my three-year-old. I'm like, what is this? It was at the art museum. And uh, they basically want to turn my little girl into an activist. Totally different from like Shel Silverstein, you know, and just, and it, one of the, one of the things, I have a little bit of hope because it's so predictable. It's, and it's, the message is, it's not based on science. It's not based on logic. In fact, Imbram Kendi actually says those things are, are racist now and working hard's racist. Um, I don't know how much longer it's going to last with something that's so untenable in such an insecure worldview that the minute you kind of push back, there's no falsifiability. In other words, there's no way to treat, uh, to show that it's false. Um, you have to, I could literally, whenever somebody, I'm getting to the point now um, that it's like I could almost predict what this person's going to say and how they basically view the whole entire world within like three or four sentences. 
And I, I'm a clinician and I, I feel like people are extremely much more complex than that. And I wish I would hear the individual because the individual is so much more interesting because I guess my next question for you, because I've, I've just noticed like since George Floyd, now churches all of a sudden just like that have completely adopted into it. And that's where I'm concerned. The university could go to hell in a handbasket, but if the church is also going to hell in the handbasket, now we really have problems. Like now I'm now I'm like legitimately concerned. Like I I think I've had those concerns with Biola for a while since my brother in law teaches. I know exactly without breaking too much. People can actually read about what's kind of going on there on some published articles online. I'll let our viewers watch that. I mean, there's some real real stuff that uh, articles are coming out. You know, and um, you're right. You know, and just I, and but now I'm there's there's a real sense i guess i'm no longer afraid i'm kind of getting out of that but i felt a lot of fear these past few months because now i saw churches now buying into it and when the church and you when the person doesn't even have a church um and the church is actually i mean I, I i was um there was a church even a local church where the pastor said um i look upon all of you and all i see is white people and i feel and he was basically now give your please please understand this you know, there's a pandemic, 30% of the people are unemployed. We live in a population where there's maybe 1.2% black. And he's looking on this North shore, New England town. And he's saying, you're all white. You should do something about it. People are committing suicide more often. People are severely more depressed. What am I supposed to do with that? And now it's making people bitter. And now it's like, and that's not good because contempt is a reason why people actually break relationships. And it's just, I'm, I'm just baffled by that because I, you see these tendency for many conservative white churches to buy into this whole white guilt movement yes. and man. And as a, and I, yeah. What, what do you think the attraction is to that? Cause I'm, I'm right there. I'm, I'm struggling with you and, and, but I'm getting to the point where I'm becoming, this is no, like I'm getting, like I'm getting mad. <laughs> like I'm like, I'm not going to feel guilty. I don't feel guilty. I don't. And I don't know if that's the right response. Maybe it is. There's a part of me that says maybe it is. And I'm like, nope, you know, I'm not going to buy into it. I mean, there's, there's a, anyway, I just, I would love to get your, I'd love to get your take on that, your advice on that really, your, your pastoral advice, but also your concerns about that, like about the I, white guilt. Yeah. I honestly will push back. I do think it's going to be here for a while. Really? Yeah. I do. I think that there's something yeah. in us, in, yeah. in, in humans who kind of want to do good. Yeah. You know? And it, it it appeals to the moral part of a person, yeah. and so now you look you're you're considered immoral if you're not standing for all of these. Mm. That that's an immoral stand. Yeah. And the way mm. that I can be moral against your immorality is to cancel you. <laughs> So I don't think that it's going anywhere anytime soon, especially with the rise of the trans movement and like all of the That's whole true. LGBTQ plus, you know, yeah. and the child studies coming alongside behind that, um, ableist yeah. studies. I don't think that this is going anywhere anytime soon. And yeah, I would agree. I it, would agree. Yeah. But it's becoming it, more predictable, I guess. That's where I'm it, 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 yeah. It's, yeah. Go yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. You said twice the ableist. I, I've never heard of that. What is the ableist? Oh, it's uh, somebody that's view. not disabled, basically. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> thank you, Brad. <laughs> Come on, Brad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no. Thank you for saying yeah, because I I would agree that it's probably going to be here for a long time, but I guess I have some hope because I think we're predicting it significantly more. It doesn't seem nearly as overwhelming. And now I listen to you, and I listen to Neil, and I listen to you know the um cynical race theories or what is it called cynical theories cynical by Henry. Theory. yeah yeah it's like oh my gosh i'm really starting to understand this and i guess that's where i'm feeling a little bit of hope like i'm i'm not nearly as overwhelmed by it like as it was a year ago it's so like anyway keep going please yeah because we're in agreement with that i think it's going to be here for like 15 maybe a long long time i, I mean yeah. I learned about it and, and I might be dating myself. And so that whole, you know, long time ago might come into play now. But oh. I learned about this <laughs> in 2001. You know, mm -hmm. I was at Biola undergrad in 2001. And mm. so it was in the university then. And you have to think about Bell mm. and Crenshaw bringing it, you know, <laughs> at the end of the 80s. Right. 
right now what we're what we're seeing is just kind of like a perfect storm of things that people feel like they can out themselves and talk about it more publicly and things like that but this is something that's been here since like 1987 right. as a formal theory you know and you can go way back and and look at cone james cone and how he talked about this he didn't call it critical race theory mm. but he was the father of black liberation theology and right. talked about whites as being oppressors. So this this has been here for a very long time. And I honestly think that it's going to be here for, for quite a while after. What I think or what I wonder is how we're going to begin to see people's attitude toward it change. Mm -hmm. How we will see within the church, either people fearing being canceled or people standing up for Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that you know, I'm... I, especially this week have prayed about is that Lord, people would, would really rise up kind of with a righteous anger and be like, no, no, yeah, we're not going right. to do this because our young people are, are seriously being plucked off. Hmm. Yeah. You know, when, when we think about the, the, you know, sheep and the wolves, the people who are at your Christian universities that you are trusting to lead your kids, some of those people really are wolves and they just they're plucking them off. Hmm. Hmm. The church is adopting this ideology because there is a guilt. There is, when you look back in, in, in during like the civil rights era, it was the black church or it was the liberal church that came alongside Martin Luther King and came alongside in the civil rights movement. The conservative even, evangelical church, even though there were some, I'm not saying there was nobody, but there weren't a lot of conservative evangelicals to step into this space. Right. Right now, what you're seeing, mm. I believe, in part, is a a white guilt from the white evangelical church saying, oh, we were more committed to doctrine then than we were to our brothers and sisters. We don't want to make that error again. And so now we're going to be more committed to our brothers and sisters of color than we are to doctrine. Yeah. Not Not understanding that this critical race theory is really coming against your doctrine. It's coming against scripture. The mm. the way that the way that you um, are saved is different. You know mm -hmm. your your sanctification is different. Mm -hmm. And so, on some level, they aren't seeing the the trade off. You know, the question is, how do we do justice where justice is needed? A biblical form of justice. So, and and in doing that, we are upholding doctrine. But I think what what we're doing is that we want to adopt the culture's narrative. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's happening too often is mm -hmm. that there's an adoption of the culture's narrative. When we're called to be the light on the hill, what we're doing is we're going down to the valley, borrowing some candles and trying to come back up and be a light. And that's not, that's mm -hmm. never going to work. It's never going to work to adopt a cultural mindset or a cultural narrative and bring that into the church and try to call that Jesus. Amen. Yeah. And so, yeah. So maybe it's maybe it's been here even longer than since James Cone. It's been here since uh, did God really say? <laughs> you know, yeah. so yeah. you know maybe it's been here um, for a lot longer than that. Yeah. Well, speaking of just the infiltration yeah. into yeah. the church, mm -hmm. um, what is the? I, we have mm -hmm. a pastor in our denomination. I'm in the PCA Presbyterian Church in America, and there are several pastors kind of introducing this to their congregation, whether it's through book studies or, you know, um, I know, I, I know churches that are going through the color of compromise, which we did want to ask you about as well in a moment. But uh, one of our first episodes was a review of that book. And it's still one that I think um, is the most popular of our podcast because people are interested in finding, a, you know, critiques of that and uh, assessments of it. And, and instead, people are just blindly going into these book studies. And even as you mm. said, you're learning about history. There's some value to the history as it's portrayed, but it's the assumptions that are made at the end of the book. It's the recommendations that are made. Mm -hmm. Anyways, all that to say, I, in our denomination, there's just a lot of toying with Black Lives Matter, partnering with them as a ministry. Clearly, that's associated with uh, cultural Marxism. And as the founders admit, they're Marxists and they, they're pushing forth this social agenda. Um, so mm. how do we respond um, to, uh, basically mm. one of the arguments for their partnership with Black Lives Matter and even leading some of the chapters, local chapters, right? There's a pastor and he's the, he's the leader of the Black Lives Matter chapter in that region. And like, what is going on? And their, their argument is, look, 
we have Republicans and Democrats, and they, you know, you partner with these kind of uh, parties, political parties. So it's no different. It's just a party. I'm not a so. I'm not saying that I advocate for everything on the platform of Black Lives Matter. Clearly, I'm a Christian first, and so they're. It's like they're just. They're just. I don't know. Like, what's the danger there? Do you have? I'm sure you've seen some of that, but like, what's your response to that sentiment? Where, look, we can we can appreciate um, a bulk of what they're doing without accepting or swallowing everything that they're saying. I generally preface this by saying I do love Black lives. I am Black, just in case <laughs> somebody misses it. I am Black. But I can't get on board with Black Lives Matter. And I don't think, I, I just feel like if you're a Christian, you shouldn't. You yeah. know, part of it is is the the parsing out of Black lives, which Black lives you stand for. You know, if you're killed by a white police officer, sure, Black Lives Matter is going to show up. But if you're killed on the South Side of Chicago, um, you know, by a gang bullet, or in South LA and Compton and you get killed by, you know, you're a black person, you get killed. Where are they? I don't see them showing up there. I don't see them showing up at the abortion clinic. And these are things that people, mm. I feel like say all the wow. time. And, wow. but, but it's mm. true. Like, mm -hmm. where are they? Where mm. are, where is black lives matter? And some of the, the atrocities that are happening within the black community, where black mm. lives matter at when at the check cashing place. You know, that's taking 18, 20 percent of somebody's check because they don't have a bank account. They don't know how to open one. Like, where is black life? If Does black life really matter or does it really matter only when when they're killed by somebody who's white? Mm. One, two. Um, did, and they've scrubbed it from their website. But on their old website, it was all about black trans life. That's that's the life that they want to promote. Yeah. You know, or um, like this this thing of stand. They didn't. It didn't say standing against the nuclear family, but they they had verbiage on there that they were against the nuclear family. Well, the nuclear family is the pillar of society. The nuclear family was created by God. Mm. Yeah, I don't see much that I can get on board with with Black Lives Matter at all. Mm -hmm. I I really don't, and I know I I get. I haven't gotten my fair share of a flack for that. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I, I have I have a black brother, I have black sisters, I have black nephews, I have black friends. I yeah. love them all dearly. And I still can't get on board with an organization. And people are like, well, you know, I don't support the organization, but I support the movement and I'm gonna hashtag it. Don't nobody know what you're talking about with the hashtag. Right. All they see is Black Lives Matter. Now, if if you go on YouTube, and I'm hoping it's still there, but Patrice Culler is one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. She actually did an interview and talked about the African spiritualism that is behind the hashtag, that's behind the Say the Name movement. So and whenever a Black person is killed or um, you know, there's some form of injustice, they want to say the name. Right. But that has a whole nother connotation behind it, a whole nother meaning when you're wow. doing this say the name stuff. No, mm -hmm. I I'm, I just, I can't get on board with that. And as Christians, I don't believe that we should either. I think we're gonna have to take our line in the sand and say no. And I know that many Christians and many churches wanna be on the right side of history. <laughs> that to me, that's a weak excuse. Like mm -hmm. you, are, uh, whose right side of history are you trying to be on? The right side of history of Jesus or the right side of history with the culture? Mm. We have to we have to draw a line in the sand because if not, we are going to see many Christians plucked off to a fake worldview. Amen. Yeah. Well, that's why we start. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I, feel like, that's, I didn't know I was getting good. a free sermon tonight. <laughs> so, I know. Well, I sermons should be free. So. <laughs> All right, y'all. Y'all, the stuff no, I have no, no. seen this week. Well, also, I was, I was about to do this for you. Just let it be your show for now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I know. I mean, no, the stuff I've seen this week has pissed me off. Like, I can't yeah. even. And, and I think the worst thing that I saw this week that just grieved my heart Hmm. was some young people, they, they were all white. They're trying to understand their whiteness. They're trying to understand their fragility and their privilege. And they said a prayer out of uh, uh, prayers for the privileged. Okay. And I mean, this was as made up as taking communion with Skittles and like yeah. Coke. Hmm. But they believe that they have, 
what'd you say? For Trayvon Martin. Yeah. You know, like it's as made up as that. At some point, we have to have conversations about worshiping the correct God correctly, as my friend Krista would say. Mm -hmm. Mm. There aren't, you know, so now we we have prayers just for privileged people. Mm. What does that look like now? For we, now, we have scriptures just for privileged people. I heard a sermon a couple of weeks ago, yeah, in a chapel where the speaker was saying that the beatitudes weren't for the privileged. Oh, we have to understand that if we are taking this stance, what are the implications? What does it mean for Christianity moving forward? I do wonder, you know, it's, you bring up, I mean, what do you think of like even the word racism? I'm struggling with this. I love your thoughts on this. I mean, this isn't the next question, but I mean, it, it's, should we even use the word racism anymore? And let me, if I could finish this, just because racism now is no longer defined as judging you according to your skin color. It's as Jamar would define it in, in like it is the new definition is if you're socially, social, socioeconomically disadvantaged, as a person of color, that is a, that is an example of racism, and and the, the definition has totally changed. Plus power, yeah, yeah that's and, 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 prejudice plus power. power. And so I'm wondering if rather as Christians, maybe not even using the word for a while until it actually gets the definition back. And what I mean by that, so we talk about we talk about the Bible says a lot about pride. The Bible talks a lot about um, uh, favoritism. The Bible talks a lot about um, slander. So why are we slandering every single officer in the United States as if they just want to kill black people? That's slander. That's breaking the ninth commandment. And I've got cops who are my clients. I've got cops who are my friends. I can't tell you the amount of depression and the suicide rate right now they're facing. Where does the church mean? You know, how are they meeting them? Are we not concerned about slandering God's word? I mean, that's the ninth commandment. So I'm wondering if we should even use verbiage that's purely biblical. And, I, you know, and I am because I don't know if we're going to get anywhere with a lot of the common language that we used 20 years ago when we said these words that we almost have to get back to the ba the basics of this is what this is what um favoritism is and this is how you experience favoritism this is how you experience real oppression and it has nothing to do with jesus doesn't talk about skin color and i'm just i don't know what your take is on that should we redefine the words i mean should we start afresh because you're onto something and i i would love your yeah, I'm I'm struggling there. <laughs> you know, I'm almost like wanting just to not even use the word. I just want to say, are you showing favoritism and pride and use you? actual biblical sins? So I'm and, I'm yeah. gonna yes and a no. Okay. Yeah. Because some of these words are biblical. Mm. Love is a biblical word, com being completely redefined. Yeah. If you don't support X, Y, and Z, you don't love me. Right. right. And redefine love. We can't allow culture to hijack love. I can be clear and I can ask you, what is the definition that you're referring to? Mm -hmm. But let me be clear on my definition. Justice. Mm -hmm. we, we, we adopt a narrative of social justice. Justice is justice. Justice is the biblical term justice. Now, because we, we want to have conversations with people in culture, we will use the term social justice. Justice is only social because it involves people. Right. Right. Justice is justice. So to me, instead of using social justice, I generally tend to use the word justice. Mm. Yeah. So for, you know, there's that. Now, racism, I think... Um, Early on, I would I would talk a lot about when I first came out, I would talk a lot about partiality. Right, right. And, and yeah. use that term. I think that I think that as Christians, we do have language that is specific mm. to kingdom culture. Right. And right. I believe that the world wants to take and hijack some of those those terms, justice and love to be like examples of that. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that we can be extremely clear in our definitions. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're using the term racism or not, it's important that you understand that racism is now being redefined. But, you know, when you're talking about racism, be clear in your definitions and say, look, when I'm talking about racism, I'm talking about this. I'm talking about partiality. I'm talking about treating someone different. I do not do that. I am not a racist. Mm. And people, people will say, you know, well, you don't subscribe to this. And you're right. I don't. I don't subscribe to that definition. You know what? That's made up. And that's mm. a lot of what we're seeing. A lot of these things are made up. This is this is your opinion. 
Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of in two minds about it, but I I definitely think that the church is giving over a lot. We are giving over a lot. And we, at some point, need to say, no, you can't have love. Mm. Right. You can try, you can, but love, this, this belongs in our camp. And if you even think that you want to use the word love, let's be clear and understand that you are borrowing from my worldview. Right, right. Hey Peter, you got one more yeah, question. Yeah, I, I know. Like, I could I could keep going. Okay, so, yeah. And, and I, I mean I do want to say I'm talking too much. Y'all can mute me. No, okay. no, no. Hold on, hold on. I just want to say, Peter, before you get to that, I'd like to highlight some comments and just say if there yeah. is anyone watching live that wants to ask a question. Sure. We're we're a little short on time, but I want to let um let Monique uh and you know answer anything yeah, you might please. say. Yeah, let's bring those up. One of the one of the comments um on YouTube here is from Minnie, Millie Doll. I'm Hi, praying. Millie. <laughs> I figured she might be someone you know. I'm <laughs> praying white people stop talking on this illegitimate non-biblical guilt that I believe is making things worse, especially in the church. Yeah. Um, so amen to that. Yes, she will. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, and then she has another comment we might, might throw out later, but I did want to get Peter, let you ask the last question and then just yeah, I mean, well, I, I really started getting into this because I was um, uh, following Jamar and uh, he read a lot of his articles. And then I think he read, I think he wrote an article a few years ago saying, I think I'm basically arguing for a a black only Lord's communion. And that's when I had my red flags come up with a lot of this movement. I was like, oh dear, that's not good. That's, 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 this isn't good. And I, I, uh, I, I, I went, I lived in Mississippi for five years and I experienced really serious racism down there. And that's, that's what that same racist white elder told me of why I, when I was talking to a young black woman down the church, I said, come on up and listen to my sermon. And she's like, no, sir, you can't. I'm like, okay, you don't have to call me, sir. And, and, and by the way, I think I am older than you. So I'm, you, I'm picking on myself. So let's not get too much on that. But like when I asked her and then I went to the, I went to the elder and I said, Hey, why don't you come up? And he's like, Oh no, sir. She's the child of Cain. And you know, it was just like, Oh, I'm going to Boston. I'll see you later. And that's that anyway. So when Jamar wrote that, I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's the white elder and he's using it. And Anyway, enough about. I, but what what are your thoughts on him? And you give some of my thoughts, <laughs> but and his work of reconciliation. And it seems to be that I I'm reading you know Imran Kendi. I read a lot of his work. That Jamar seems to be. Tell me if I'm wrong, but basically baptizing Kendi and using Bible verses, and that's about it. You know, I'm not seeing. I I, I basically you know, and he's many Christians though they're not really aware of Kendi's work, but they're very aware of Jamar's work. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm concerned because I don't think anybody has taken him on directly. I think they're all afraid. Um, why do you think so many Christians are caught off guard with this new wave? And um, what are your takes on him? And I would love to. Yeah, just, that's my last question for tonight. <laughs> um, I I honestly think that people don't know what to think. There's not a lot of resources out there that aren't CRT, that aren't the take of, of, of Tisby. So for the longest time, I would say within the last month, um, or actually a couple months ago, Ratio Christi, a ministry um, to ca- college campuses and college students, they did a booklet and you can go and find it online. They did it with Pat Sawyer and um, Neil Shinvey. Oh. talking about the contradictions between um, like critical race theory and Christianity and how we're seeing critical race theory within the church. It's an awesome resource. It's a free download. You can you can just go to Rashio Christie. I believe you can go to their website and you can download that. So I think that's great. Um, there's a book that just came out, I'd say within the last month on um, social justice called why biblical justice or why social justice is not biblical justice. And I believe his name is Scott Allen, David. They've, yeah. Something, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th- there's that work. And then Thaddeus Williams, he's a professor at Biola. Hmm. He is coming out on the 23rd of December with a book called, um, Confronting injustice, um, no, yeah, confronting injustice without compromising truth. 
And it's 12 questions that every Christian should be asking about like critical race theory and the social justice movement. Aside from that, there aren't hmm. too many other things that I, I mean, other resources that I can really tell people about. Miles McPherson has a book that came out uh, a couple years ago now called The Third Option. Yeah. yeah. But by hmm. and large, the people who have the biggest voices are Tisby, um, Evans, what's it? Um, not Evans, um, Mason, Eric Mason, right? Charlie yeah. Dates. Well, yeah, well, well, the woke church book, and they're they're pushing it. They're pushing it. Brian Loritz, they're mm -hmm. pushing this this narrative, and and they've been adopted by big publishing houses, um, things like Right Now Media, and so they have a platform to get out there. And people who don't, their stuff isn't being seen. And so I think the church not knowing what else to do and kind of being caught off guard, not aware of what's happening in culture, really, they they picked it up because, well, surely we have to do something. Yeah. This must be the way to do it. I don't um, I'm not a fan of, of Tisby's work. I think that he is mm. is divisive. I think he's separating, you know, white and black and that's not what I see in scripture. We mm. need to understand our identity as children of God and mm. walk from a place of unity. When we, talk, when we talk about racial reconciliation, I used to be a huge proponent of racial reconciliation, go to little ra racial reconciliation meetings at school and stuff. On this side of it, I don't know where we find racial reconciliation in scripture. Now we find mm. reconciliation that you can look, um, is it, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5 again. You can look in scripture and see, re, you can see reconciliation, but that's reconciliation to God. And because of that re reconciliation to God, we have reconciliation among one another. And then when you look in Ephesians, it talks about us being brothers and sisters because mm -hmm. of the work that Christ did. There, where, where is it talking about racial reconciliation? We've been reconciled because of the blood of Jesus. So we can talk about unity, you right. might need to talk to your racist friend or I might need to talk to my racist friend about, hey, look, y'all already <laughs> reconciled. You need to learn how to walk together, have some conversations, go to coffee. Like, what do we do with unity? But I don't need to talk about racial reconciliation. To me, that's kind of made up. Mm. And it's a made up thing that we are putting on the white church. Y'all need to go. Why ain't your church multicultural? Why isn't your church diverse? Why aren't you doing um, racial reconciliation work? Nobody asked the black church when they're going to do racial reconciliation work. Hmm. What would you say to white people? What would you say to people like people who are playing with guilt and stuff? Because that was like, what would you say to people that are like feeling this load and they're stuck and they're listening to you and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I, but they don't know what to do with that. What I mean, is there anything you would say? Get in your word, my goodness. Get in the word. Make sure you are in the word. One. Yeah. Um, yeah. Two, to understand that critical race theory is not the way. Critical race mm -hmm. theory is going to continue to divide us on a black white binary. Mm. That is that's just the work of what it what it does. Mm -hmm. Three, racism is real. I don't mm. have to affirm critical race theory in order for me to understand that racism is real. <laughs> but every racism isn't behind every tree either. I think there are there are mm. You know, if you find yourself struggling with white guilt and things like that, I would say get in a conversation with the Lord. What is he calling you to? Man. Mm -hmm. What is mm -hmm. he saying that you should mm -hmm. be doing in this season of your life? Because the mm -hmm. culture is going to try to put things on you all the time and they're ill-fitting. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's like where uh, I said this in a talk I did a couple months or last month, something like that. Y'all ever heard that the shirt size medium? <laughs> so medium is when it when it's not a small but it's not a medium it don't really fit but you right. you try and wear it and think you're cute okay <laughs> you know you, i'm gonna try this shirt on it's cute. That's, that's 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 what's happening in culture right now and white people are trying to put on something that's ill-fitting and they uncomfortable right like, right how much longer i gotta keep this on no get, get with the lord and get comfortable let him explain to you let him talk to you get in scripture find out what are you responsible for generational mm. guilt i would say no mm. what do we do with with old testament passages that say that the 
the the teeth sons will not will no longer be set on edge because of the sins of the father and so many other things what do we do when we look in the new testament it says that we each will have to go and give account like right. you know there are there are ways that that we can be grieved and grieve like i can grieve with people with image bearers um who have found themselves murdered or killed or you know whatever because that's sad and I don't have to wear the guilt and the burden like like it like I am personally responsible for it. Mm. Mm. But I think what what's happening in culture is that every white person is now personally responsible yeah. for racism. Mm. So I don't know. Those, those and, are some good of word. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, yeah. and I just add like along those lines. Mm. If you're responsible for that, then you must repent of it. And repentance is very shallow and superficial if you don't, if it's so vague, your sin is so vague, right? That it's privilege, white privilege. Well, first of all, you got to define that. What is my sin in that privilege? How can I truly repent, which is going to involve grieving and hating my sin, turning away from that sin? So how do I turn away from my privilege? You know, it's, it's, it's just, it convolutes theology so bad that you're essentially redefining all the theological terms we learned in seminary, which you've had mm -hmm. 27 minutes, but you're going to get all those terms, right? Yep. I mean, yes. And, and so and you're already, you, you're already a uh, far down, far, far, further down the road than most seminary students. So I'm yes. Gonna yeah. It'll be helpful for you. But, but then and, and like to finish yeah. out what you were mm. saying, like a thought, not that I need to finish it out, no, but no, a no, thought no, that came to me while you were speaking is that, you know, if you're white, you're always going to have this privilege. Right. That you can't that actually kinda, repent of it. You can't, how are you going to get rid of it? How am I going to fully right. turn away and right. fully divest myself of something that I had no part in? Like, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't ask to be born white. I didn't ask to be born black, you know? So now is it a continual repentance? Do I have to repent and repent? Like how many days do I repent? Mm -hmm. How do I know that I'm fully, you know, forgiven? Yeah. What, what are all the steps that come with that? What does sanctification look like? Right. The, all of these things get redefined. And that's mm. what anti-racism is saying, right? It's like you're constantly mm. working on it. You never yes. actually move beyond it. So again, that's not a message of hope. It's a message of guilt that you just perpetuate in that guilt mm. bed. Anyways, I don't know if we want to wrap this up, Peter. We're yeah, no, I guess this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, so too, time. I should just say too, just as a clinician, I've heard an amazing amount of suffering from... Yeah. all people yes. and suffering doesn't suffering doesn't it's not like it picks and chews it's skin color mm -hmm. i've i've sat with people who have lost their five-year-old little boy and you know and i've sat with people that have been people of color that would say i've never actually experienced racism i've lived very privileged lives and i'm mm -hmm. i'm i make millions of dollars a year and i'm great you know it's not like suffering goes off and says i'm going to choose this color and ignore all the rest it's just not mm -hmm. it's the it's yeah it's it's such a it's such a shallow and bland statement that hijacks the trauma that people really it's very invalidating yeah. to people's serious trauma that you may be facing as somebody that has experienced such a significant amount of pain and to minimize it based on the color of his skin that he's not that he's somehow advantageous to millions of other people just by the look of him it's mm -hmm. just one of the most bigoted statements i think or, or statements in our culture right now and it's like if you're not even curious by the person you're talking to or with the person you're talking to i don't i i think we have to we have to go back quite a few steps ahead to make some progress in this conversation you know i mean because i I don't, you know, I, I don't know really where to go with you on that other than let's maybe start from the beginning. And that's kind of like, yeah, that's why I was like, where do we, I thank you for that. Cause I was I, the struggling with like, where do the, do we start afresh? Do we start new <laughs> you know, right here? Did you want to read that last one, Brad, and then wrap it up? And then um, I want to tell everybody about where to find you um, as well. Only, so that's the only thing I wanted to read was uh, was to say to ask Monique to share with us where we can find her work. Yeah, and, yeah. And discuss, um, you know, I know your Center Center for Biblical Unity, which is in your name there. That's a website where we can learn more about you and, and yeah, kind of even follow yeah. what you're doing. 
right? Yeah, mm-hmm. you can go to the Center for Biblical Unity dot com, nice. um, Center for Biblical Unity dot com, or you can find us on Facebook at the Center for Biblical Unity. We're on Twitter at Biblical underscore Unity. I'm on Twitter at the Real Monique D. We're on Instagram, Center for Biblical Unity, YouTube. <laughs> I, I want to say the YouTube might be under my name, the Romo D. Yeah. But um, yeah, you can find us on all the platforms. We are there. Come join us. We we have a family model, especially on our Facebook platform. Mm. What my goal and what I believe the Lord is calling me to is really to just build the family dynamic to remind people that despite the craziness, <laughs> we can have a place of refuge and of safety. And I don't care what your color is. I don't care who your mama was, what you did. <laughs> we are, we we're family and we're going to come and we are going to, to be family. And yeah. So actually I have a family meeting. We, every Thursday <laughs> at six, we do the family meeting and it's on Facebook. Again, the center for biblical unity. It's a live stream. And I just, I have a list of things to talk about. And sometimes I come very unprepared, but you know, it's all the cousins. We all just, it's like a family reunion. Yeah. What's the week? Yeah. We just all just get in yeah. there and, and talk. People put prayer requests. We, um, you know, we just do family and it doesn't matter what your color is because we're in Christ. Now, when we talk yeah. about the world and what they believe, that's something else. But when you step into the kingdom of God, we have a different, a different mm. set of presuppositions. Monique, you've been so encouraging. Thank you yeah. just for bringing God's word. I mean, I think we needed this more than I think we may realize. This is just really wonderful. It's just it's refreshing. This is what we need. Yeah, I mean, I I I love it. It's the gospel. Yeah, yeah. and we don't redefine and it. And I just I love it. Just that's what we need. Mm. That's good. Thanks. And the love other it. thing I want to say is your podcast, mm. All the Things Podcast. That's the title of it with uh, your. Co-host, ministry uh, partner Rick, Krista yeah. Bontrager. Find her. You yeah. guys find her. If you if you are looking yeah. for some theology that is sound and easy, like like it, it mm-hmm. makes sense. She. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna say she's gonna give you an easy word. If you looking like, well, give me ten reasons why I can support BLM. She she ain't the one. But go to um, theologymom.com or find her on Facebook, Theology Mom. Awesome, awesome theologian. Yeah, I think I found you through her. So oh. yeah, I know. Yeah, I think that's how I found. Anyway, I loved what you had to say, and I reached out a few months ago. So thank you. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. It's never too late. Well, have Wonderful. a happy Thanksgiving. Well, uh, hope you, you too. Have a yeah. yeah, yeah, I really too. do. Yeah, I. This is this is wonderful. I um really appreciate you coming on, Monique. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks. I'm glad yeah. to come. Yeah. Go ahead and end yeah. it. But thank you again. And we'll be sure to introduce uh, or to share all of your information with uh, with our listeners. So hope hope that your ministry continues to grow and that your guys is working. You. We we need more more people doing this right now for sure. To- yes. And I oh my gosh, that that's such a good a good thought. Like we do need more people, and right. it's not with, with it's not out of bounds. We have to get back to orthodoxy. Like, you know, we need to make orthodoxy great again. We need yeah. to we need to to use our voice, our vote, and our dollar. And that is something that's within the power of each individual. Yeah. One person you may want to follow is uh, Stasios, Carmen. Carmen at Stasios. Uh, it's called Stasios.org. And it's uh, Carmen Schober, I believe her last name is. And we had her on as well as her co-host, Ian. And they have a really cool website. And they're doing a lot of great work. And, um, and we have this sort of bold Christianity, bold Christianity right? bold and just Christianity. the same stuff, just like all around the gospel attacking these issues. So we're coming. Something's coming out of this. So that's, I, yes. have, I have hope. Yes. <laughs> right. Amen. Well, yes. thank you so okay. much again, yeah. Monique. Thanks for uh, Thanks, Monique. joining us for longer than we asked you to. I appreciate yes. that. No worries. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. All right. All right bye.